Hello, I'm on day four of a splitting headache and I think it's because my wig is too tight or it's trying to burrow its way inside. Either way, this bad boy's coming off. Hi, hello, it's Kendall here. If you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up home skillet biscuit? Happy Halloween, check out my candy corn nails even though real candy corn is disgusting. Happy 500K, cause that happened. Happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturday is, Saturday is when I do a little something on my channel called the Bad Movies in a Beat. Series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on. Last week we talked about what happens when the vagina has a vendetta. When we looked at the horror film called Teeth, a story of a woman who had teeth. Besides its ludicrousy, it did make a few points. And if you want to check that out, you really should up above. Find the bad movies in a beat playlist. And this week, because we're closing out the spooky season and also it's landing specifically on Halloween, I said, of course we have to look at a horror movie. And what else is more timely is that everybody in Name Mama was recommending or requesting or demanding, honestly, that I look at Hulu's new movie, it's an original film, horror satire film called Bad Hair. That entire premise is that a woman gets a weave and it starts killing people. It's a killer weave. Now, now, sending me the trailers, they said, Kendall, this looks atrocious. Please bring it to bad movies in a beat. And I watched it. And then I watched it again. And then I had to watch it a third time because the first two times, ironically, I was doing my hair. And the first two times I did not like it. <laughs> I thought it was stupid. I thought it was like, ah, crap. It was such a wasted opportunity to have like a very important conversation about certain things. But by the third time I said, I don't know that I can definitively call this a bad movie. I know. I know, I know. Once I reached that conclusion, I went to Twitter because I go with all of my thoughts on Twitter. I really tweet way too much. I love the love-hate relationship I have with people that have me on notifications. That's your fault, but also thank you because that means you can't help but love the foolishness. And for those that have seen it, I have already been dragged from y'all. Y'all have already dragged me. Say psych right now. <laughs> Please don't tell me you actually thought that was a good movie. I feel like if you just watch the film, you're gonna be like, wow, this is stupid, this is corny, this is really bad acting and really bad CGI, really bad everything, honestly. And yeah, even on the surface, you can recognize that they're trying to have an underdeveloped conversation about how black women have needed to assimilate through hair and how they shouldn't have to do that. Maybe even on the surface, it looks as though it's demonizing women who wear extensions and weaves and wigs and what have you. But dare I say, this movie is a little bit deeper than that. And I know I'm in the minority. I know I'm in the minority of people. <laughs> I think most people think of this as just a stupid movie, which is fine, you can continue to do that. As corny and and dated and weird as it is, it was made in a very meticulous way that I respect. It was too carefully made and too thoughtfully made for me to call it bad. I don't know if it's enough to call it good, but I can't call it bad. So this is bad question mark movie and a beat. I'll leave it up to you. How about this? Watch the movie, come back to this video with your own opinions, and then we can discuss. And that may not necessarily change your opinions about the movie. You don't have to like the movie. And I still don't really know if I like the movie. Like it's a very valiant attempt on social commentary. Granted, told through a super cheesy movie. I'm getting ahead of myself, let's start. So in the very beginning of the film, we see a young girl, two young girls actually. The youngest is getting her first relaxer. The older girl, that's her cousin, and she lives with her cousin and her aunt and uncle. Her cousin is lighter skin, and she makes some kind of remarks about how it was long overdue, they should have given her a relaxer a long time ago. You know, now she looks more like her sister get rid of her nappy hair. But her hair is painfully burned off from the relaxer and it ends up resulting in a scar in the back of her head. Fast forward and it's Los Angeles, 1989. And that young girl has grown up to be Anna, our main character, a young black woman working as a secretary for a black focused pop culture television station called 
culture. And this is where I really took note of the aesthetics of the film, the, the look of the film. The movie isn't just set in the 1980s, it's meant to look like it was made in the 1980s as well, which is a very particular choice. Like the outfits give you the vibe, the hair gives you the vibe, the makeup gives you the vibe, but also the graininess of the film is meant to mimic how grainy films were in the 1980s. The angle choices, the weird close-ups, and later, as we'll find out, the atrocious CGI are all meant to replicate the style of 80s movies. There's something nostalgic, old about it, which made sense when I thought about how they referred to the movie as a satire horror film. Because at first I was very confused. I was like, satire? What, what is being satirized? I was confused. Like who, what, where are we making fun of? And the thing is, it was kind of making fun of when? It was making fun of the 80s. Because in later parts of the movie, I'm over here like, oh my God, this looks terrible. But then I realized it's supposed to. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. So we see Anna and she's trying to interview for a singular black anchor spot. Anchor, is that the right? Disc jockey spot for a rock radio station. So a white radio station. We just lean a little bit more rock than urban here. Perfect. I appeal to a global audience, you know? Anna gets declined and we see all of the other black women who are outside waiting for an interview. And one thing that you notice is that every single black woman is like a different type of black woman that they could be looking for. Are they looking for the urban black woman? Are they looking for Claire Huxtable? Are they looking for Whitney Houston? Black women must fit into a very particular mold of blackness to get work during this time period. And you don't even know which one they're looking for. This is something that comes up later in the film as well. So that's just a mark. Black women have to figure out how to be the most acceptable black woman, even when there's like no spots for black women anyway. <laughs> she doesn't get that job, but she returns back to her work as a secretary at Culture. One day at her job, she's called into the conference room with all of her other colleagues to find out that one of the executive suits, the white guy that owns the black channel, comes in and says, hey, the boss that you've always had, Edna with the fire ass micro braids. That is a long time she's had those. Those look good. Is leaving the company. And she will be replaced by a more glamorous, a light skinned, a light eyed, a weave wearing former supermodel named Zora played by Vanessa Williams. Which by the way, this movie has a pretty impressive amount of recognizable faces in it. Like, wow. Including, but not limited to, Vanessa Williams, Usher, Kelly Rowland, Laverne Cox, Jay Farrow. This dude who is fine and everything I've ever seen him in. What is it? Blair Underwood. Sexy ass. That was study. I'd be loved. To, wow, I was about to make an Underwood joke. Let me continue. My theory is that they were able to <laughs> afford so many people because they could skimp out on CGI. But yes, Zora has come in to be a fresh new outlook on the channel and bring it into respectability, wide audience friendly, if you will. So on Edna's way out, she tells them that she's leaving to create her own company, her own production space that the girls can come and work for if they would like to later. But in the meantime, they have to stay at the production company. So I mentioned that Kelly Rowland is in this movie. She plays a very Janet Jackson-esque pop star by the name of Sandra, who makes a bop. Actually, if you consider this a bad movie, which is debatable, we can talk about that. If you consider this a bad movie, this really holds up the idea that the worse the movie is, the better the music, because the music in here is fire. Her, I've been singing her little like ditty that she sings for her part. You don't want my love, I get it. They overplay it too much in the movie, but now it's stuck in my head. This superstar that Anna is really into, and her and her friends are kind of looking at her music video and they were like, what is going on with her hair? Like, how can she like flip her hair around like that? Is it a wig? Is What is it? And they were like, it's a weave, which is this new thing <laughs> going on. So I don't know how accurate that is to time. I don't know when weaves really became a thing, but it's this thing and they weave hair into your braids and whatever. And it's like, wow, that sounds painful. You know, the whole thing when people don't know what a weave is. And this is the beginning of Anna considering 
hmm, this weave thing might be into it. Another thing to note is that Anna has been smashing one of her coworkers, Julius, who's actually the host of their most popular show called The Block. He's breaking up with Anna, basically telling her that he's seeing someone else and they have to stop seeing each other, essentially. Apparently they've had like a sexual relationship for years, but him breaking up with her is just the beginning of all the things that apparently are going wrong in Anna's life. Because she has the new boss, Zora, her job may be on the line because everyone's getting fired. Her rent just went up $500 since the white folks moved in and she's on the cusp of getting evicted. You're 10 days late, don't think I won't kick your ass out of here. Life is a mess, honestly. But yeah, people start getting fired. Left, right, and center at the job once Zora starts working there. And what happens is that Anna has to come in and basically do an interview about why they should keep her. She tells Zora that she came up with their most popular segment, which is the block that Julius hosts. She gives her a whole rundown of like new ideas that she has and how much she has to contribute. And Zora's impressed. She's like, okay, this girl can stay. She seems to have some good ideas. One thing that she needs to do, change her looks. You need to get a weave, is what she tells her essentially in so many words. She's like, my my girls have a particular look and you're not, you know, the cotton puff thing is not really working for us. We're not, we're not really doing the whole Afrocentric thing. You should get a weave. So she gives her a card to go to a salon called Virgie's in which they do, you know, celebrity hair. So I mentioned this earlier that as a child, Anna was staying with her cousin. Or did I mention that? She was. As a child, she stayed with her aunt, uncle, and cousin. And she goes over to visit them. Uncle is very, very big into slave lore, talks a lot about it, and tries to instill knowledge of black history and literature. But effectively, the uncle ends up being our kind of, you know, the horror trope of like the wise old woman that knows all the history. Instead, they just made it her uncle. Kind of gives her this very disorienting warning that I completely didn't hear the first time because I was completely shocked by the change in continuity with angles. <laughs> Yeah, she most definitely wasn't sitting over there. Where are you looking? I don't know if that was like a stylized disorienting shot or not. Like if they did that on purpose, but um, interesting. Basically, Anna kind of scoffs at him believing in kind of the fairy tales and folk tales of slave lore. Surprised to see a room full of people tripping over superstitions and fairy tales. Fairy tales. And he essentially rebukes her. You subjugate a people by telling them they're Science is superstition. Their faith is heresy and their wisdom is make-believe. To poo-poo all the spirituality is essentially to disconnect from the history, the way that the white man always made you want to be disconnected, make you ignorant to yourself. From the moment you are born, you are so thoroughly indoctrinated by the insanity of Western European worldviews. You can't bear to see yourself the way nature would have. He, he's right, but the, it was so intense. <laughs> It's, it, it really like, whoa, okay. Like it was profound and everything, but my I'm gonna need you to blink. Later that day, her aunt finds out that Anna is about to get evicted because she doesn't have that extra $500 that her rent went up, but she gives her the money to pay it off. But instead of paying it off, she goes to Virgie's, the hair salon place to get her a weave. She goes to the front desk and she's like, how much is it? And they tell her it's $450 for a weave. And if you recall, her rent went up by $500. so all of her money. She's kind of like, hey, can you help a sister out? Yada, yada, yada. This place is incredibly pretentious and they're like, whatever, jigaboo. Ha 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 ha. Field Negro. <laughs> Go forth with your nappy naps and your beady beads and be gone. She walks past her and goes up to Virgie. Can you do some charity on my hair? And Virgie essentially says, fine. I'll do it for you. This would be my good deed of the day. Girl, did they make her bake with turmeric? Banana jaundice, oh my God. After her day's clientele is done, she has time to do Anna's hair. She braids her up in the most traumatic scene of the entire movie. That was visceral, like I could feel that. Get your hair braided by the wrong person. It's like they ripping it open to see what's inside. Trying to flip your cap open, what you thinking? <laughs> and then she gets to sewing and that shit hurt me. Like, she. <laughs> She was using the needle and it was getting in her skin and she was bleeding. No. And it's so bad that she passed out. Honey, that's not tenderheadedness. That's you getting a lobotomy without anesthesia. But when she wakes up, her weave is on. A full sew-in with a closure? Were closures a thing in the 80s? Did we do that? 
Was that a thing we did? I don't know. I wasn't around in the 80s. Yo, shout outs to my older viewers. Shout out to my aunties. Question, were, were closures around in the 80s? I ain't supposed to look that deep into it, I don't think. But still, I'm curious. What? But yeah, she got a weave now. That bad boy ain't going nowhere. It is attached to her brain. On the way out, Virgie gives her some pink lotion. Ugh, I could smell this scene. I always hated the scent of pink hair lotion. Uh, if you've never had the pleasure of smelling pink hair lotion, you're probably like 15. It always smelled like chamomile and beauty supply store. On the way out, Virgie's like, here's this lotion. What you do is you put it on twice a day and you make sure that your hair never gets wet. So put this on twice a day, don't get your hair wet. Before she leaves out, she sees Usher. I don't know what his name is in the movie. And he's um, dating, I believe, the pop star, Sandra. And she comes in to get a touch up after getting her hair wet. And this is where we see first of many stylized, crappy CGI choices. And we'll see Sandra's CGI'd eyes. They didn't even put contacts on her. Put it through post. Which, again, as much as I, my knee jerk reaction was to drag it, it makes sense. It makes sense if you're trying to make a crappy 80s movie. So she has her weave, she feels like a new woman. And before bed, she reads one of the stories that her uncle gave her the last time she was over his house about slave folklore. And she ends up reading a story called The Moss Hair Girl, which is about a slave woman who found a tree full of moss and she took the moss and turned it into a wig that she would wear. And it made her feel beautiful and feel more like her master's hair and come to find out that wig started attacking people. Now she never finishes this story because of that she didn't read how it ends. <laughs> and ah, we love foreshadowing. Then we get the first of several times in which a particular scene reoccurs in the movie. And that is all of her family, her uncle, her aunt, her cousin, all in the same room, traditional clothes and traditional African hair braiding and very like, Afrocentric and they're in this room having dinner and you can see hair flowing in from the top of the ceiling and then the scene ends. Over and over this scene comes up as she progressively gets more entangled ha, 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 with the wig. It's Anna's first day back on the job and now she's Weevilicious and she gets a lot of attention, like a lot of attention. There's good and bad, but no one's really indifferent. Some Everyone has an opinion to some degree or another about her new weave. But very early, we noticed that there is some evidence of the weave being thirsty for blood because she gets a paper cut and her weave just kind of like gets attached to the blood. And thereafter, Anna asks Zora if she'll be able to host her own show. And Zora's like, that's quite a leap of faith. You want me to take on someone that's never hosted a show before. Well, they took a leap of faith on Julius hosting our most popular show, so then you can take the same leap of faith on me. Then soon after she kind of remarks about how Julius is the only person that doesn't seem to be on edge with all the changes that are happening at the company. Why is that? It just seems like Julius is the only one not under a microscope. Like he's getting special treatment or something. Because we're f***ing? <laughs> What? We're f***ing. That, I mean, that, that's one way to, that's one way to let people know. And rightfully so, Anna's pissed. It's like, the reason you broke up with me is because you're smashing somebody who's old enough to be your mother. Granted, that's none of her business, but you know what I mean. You gonna sleep your way to the top like a little bitch? But Julius is a <laughs> type of dude. So he's like, oh, I like how feisty you are. This is the first time I actually heard you raise your voice. Kind of like, Fuck you. Worry not, he will get his. Anna's cousin comes over and they have dinner and the hair like sucks up the ketchup? Was your burger that rare that it was still mooing? Why is it so actively bleeding? I don't know, but <laughs> the hair eats it up. And the cousin takes the slave book back home. Okay, the next scene is a trigger warning, sexual assault, just letting you know. Anna's drunk landlord comes in, tries to sexually assault her in exchange for the increased rent. She ends up fighting him off using a box cutter and stabs him. And when he goes to sexually assault her, the weave uprises. <laughs> the weave like goes for the bloody spot and sucks him dry. Now, this scene was the first like onslaught, like a super heavily CGI'd scene. And I don't wanna show a lot of it because it is in the context of him trying to sexually assault her. But 
boy, yo, it's jarringly bad. And again, at first I was like, man, that looks horrible. I started to realize every complaint that I had about how it looked, I could explain within the story. The hair looks crappy, it looks like moss because it's supposed to be like the moss haired girl. Well, the CGI is trash. It's supposed to be set in the eighties. Like the film is supposed to be from the eighties. Of course it looks like trash. I was just like, okay. <laughs> I don't have any, I don't have any complaint. I can't say anything. Anna's like disturbed as, as you'd imagine, cause her hair just killed a man. She ends up throwing the body out the window and into the dumpster. And when she wakes up the next morning, classifying his death as an accident. They saw wine bottles and gin bottles on the ceiling and they said he probably tripped and fell into the garbage and died. I guess they weren't gonna look into that stab wound. We're not supposed to look into it that deep. And besides, he was trying to raise the rent on every black person in there, was also a rapist. So, moving right along. Also, you'll notice that her hair is a little longer than it was before she killed the man. That day at work, they have a very relevant conversation with one of the black TV personalities about her possibly getting a weave. I'm not changing who I am just to appeal to some wider, wider demographic. Presenting herself in a way that's more appealing, which is still a very prevalent conversation we can have about the respectability of black hair, black styles, and the politicizing of black hair. What is appropriate, quote unquote? What is acceptable, quote unquote? What is appealing to wide audiences? What is too different, too wild, too untamed, you know? No one's asking you to change who you are, just the way you look. Kind of how they, Appealed to her is by saying, hey, black women are magic. We can do our hair in all types of ways. You know, Patti LaBelle changes her hair 10 times in one concert, that type of thing. Shit, Patti LaBelle changed her hairstyle 20 times in one performance. Yeah, but that was her choice. A career in TV was your choice. But Anna goes in later and she's able to talk her into getting a weave because she says it makes her feel like a new person. It makes her feel different, but also like the person she was supposed to be. After having that conversation, she looks at herself in the mirror and come to find out the person that was talking wasn't really her. It was her lizard woman that's being controlled by the weave. The same power that killed the man the day before. The weave is beginning to take hold, bold hold. I should make a lot more weave jokes. Do I have the energy to make a bunch of weave jokes during this? Probably not. That's the only one you're getting out of me. <laughs> Unbelievable. That's it. That's all you're getting. Okay. <laughs> Soon thereafter, Anna starts to run out of her pink lotion. And when she doesn't have her pink lotion, her hair gets tangled and matted. I know a pack weave when I see one. Let me say something. I've had my hair <laughs> mat up like that twice in my life and it's such a soul crushing experience. It really is. She's able to get her hair somewhat detangled by the next day, but it is still a bit disheveled. The next day, the girl that they were trying to convince to get a weave now has one. And she just seems like a happier, brighter, more content person. After she leaves the room, Zora acknowledges that her hair is looking a little rough. And she's like, hey, you're running out of the pink lotion, aren't you? You still using the pink stuff? Yeah. It's not enough, is it? What? But before we can get more in depth on that, Zora leaves for lunch with Julius. Here's the scene that I'm sure a lot of you guys just clocked out and said, this movie is stupid. I am not. <laughs> and I understand that. I understand. It is weird. It makes sense in context of the story, but it is weird. I understand if you just say this movie isn't worth being taken seriously when you see the next scene, but Anna's running out of her pink stuff. And so her hair is getting matted. It's starting to look like trash. And also <laughs> on cherry on top of an awful day, she gets her period. And so she goes to the bathroom to go get a pad. But before she can, her weave might go into her pants and drink up her period blood. I have a question though. Does that make it stop earlier? Does that make it stop quicker? Is she just done with her period at that point? Cause I'm disgusted, but also intrigued. But yeah, back to the scene. I get it. I get if you just threw it away at this point, you were like, Kendall, this is stupid. I'm not, <laughs> and I'm not blaming you. I also felt the same way. I was like, are you serious? <laughs> Girl, what what is this? I understand. And you're not at fault for believing that. But it's because the weave needs blood. So it got blood and it denapified itself. And after that, the hair 
is continuing to grow. And also, as it grows, you start to notice it affecting Anna's personality more. There's a scene where there's like a business party. She's kind of this belle of the ball. She's getting all this attention from all these execs. And while there, she runs into her old boss, Edna, the, the lady with the really nice micro braids. Oh, luscious. They're so thick. Jesus, and long. Anyway, and Edna's disappointed at what her old company had turned into. It was, you know, vastly gentrified and made for a more wide audience. She remarks how those changes also reflect in Anna. She looks like she's losing herself. And she says something along the lines of like, I said that you can come work for me. You didn't have to change yourself like this. You know, I had a spot for you if you wanted to come. You know, you had a choice. Finally, after four years, you want me to start over? I can't afford that. You couldn't afford that hair, but that didn't stop you. Not with what you paid me. I mean, she has a point. And Edna goes to leave the room and the room is locked. And this scene was very confusing to me. The code is 186698. And they say that as if it's like super important. 186698. And the closest thing that I found that was relevant to that was the signing of the Civil Rights Acts 1866. But that happened in April. So maybe I'm missing something, I, I don't know. But I don't know why that's important. If that is what it's supposed to be, that's kind of a cool like nod, but also um, you got the date wrong. <laughs> back at the party, Anna ends up speaking with Usher's character and he asks Anna if she'd been back at Virgie's hair salon because ever since Sandra started going there, she's been acting a little strange. But before they can really talk about that, Anna gets pulled away and she ends up talking with some more execs. And despite her being touted as their secret weapon, they don't let her host her show. They actually give it to Zora. At the party, Zora and Julius end up getting in a fight because he was flirting with a white woman and Zora storms off. And once she's gone, he goes to talk to Anna, the woman that he screwed over. And he's like, man, she treats me like crap. And like, I miss being with you. Oh God. They have sex. And again, I know this is another scene in which you're probably like, Kendall, how are you defending this film? While she's on top, her hair comes down and turns into rope and holds him still while another strand of hair gets a glass, breaks it and gives it to her to stab him to death. It's a visually hilarious scene. I'm sorry. It's, the CGI is so bad. And some of the shot choices are so awful, but. <laughs> <laughs> get it. I get it. I get why it's like that. It makes sense to me that it's like that. There's another flash in which you see, again, her family in that room and the hair is starting to creep in more and more. And after she kills Julius, now her hair is getting even longer. It's getting more powerful. Frightened and dismayed, Anna calls her cousin to hear the rest of that moss girl story because maybe it can help. <laughs> Basically, the moss is the hair of witches of the past who use the hair to drink blood so that they can take over the wearer so that they can come back to the earth. The witches slowly take over your body so that they can come back and they each take turns rotating within your head. And that's why Anna's personality seems to be changing throughout the movie. Not me missing an entire section of the movie. <laughs> So allow me to do some voiceover work. Distraught after finding out that her weave is actually a demon, Anna goes to an Afrocentric salon to get her weave taken out by MC Light. Good God, where are they finding all these people? Where did they find the budget? Anyway, there she runs into Edna and they make up. I can't fault you for doing whatever it takes to get where they keep trying to keep us from getting. You know, in a perfect world, a woman would be able to wear her hair the f the way she wants to. But unfortunately, soon after making up, everyone dies. Edna dies, MC Light, she was barely in the script. And this girl, who, who the hell knows who she is? They all did. Anna rushes to see Zora, whom we find out is having a similarly rough time with her own weave. So Anna and Zora are both tweaking off the weave and in this like manic rush to be rid of the troubles of the weave and stop it from burrowing its way into their minds, Zora's like, it's just hair. I'm gonna cut it off. Bang. Before she can do that, the weave wraps around her necks and snaps her. So you can't do that. <laughs> 
Anna runs away incredibly slowly. <laughs> Ends up at her uncle's house? Why would you, you have a murderous weave and the first person you see is loved ones? Girl, don't love me. And basically she goes there to read up more about the moss hair girl. Again, go to a library. She ends up cross-referencing it with some stories from indigenous folklore about enchanted trees. And she wonders, does that have something more to do with the moss hair girl? Like maybe they were trying to warn black people about something. Next day at work, Zora's obviously missing cause she did. And so they're like, well, we need somebody to host the show that she was gonna host. So Anna, get out there. But alas, Anna is struggling to keep the bloodlust at bay, but she does a great job for most of the show, but she sees Zora out in the crowd and she goes to try to find her at her office after the show was over. She goes to her office and quickly finds her assistant who is swiftly disposed of. Again, in a distractingly bad CGI situation, uh, Zora turns into like a Weavatron. <laughs> I don't know what it is about this particular scene, but something about her like floating head is giving me the test tube head in Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Zordon! It's giving me Zordon. <laughs> Oh, bitch. And also again, I can see how this is distractingly bad. So you're like, Kendall, this movie is trash. Why are you trying to defend it? I'll continue. <laughs> the next few scenes is just like horror movie protocol. She's running, she's making close escapes, yada, yada, yada. And along the way, she ends up meeting this lady who is one of the women that have been on the show throughout the movie. They put a lot of focus on her in this last like 10, 20 minutes of the movie in an effort for her to be this very random comic relief. Look, I cannot die today, okay? I've been in church for like 15 years. If I had to say my biggest gripe with this movie, it's actually this part. This is very reminiscent to some of the issues I had with like Get Out particularly. One of the biggest gripes I had with that movie was the comic relief, the cop guy. He was just so tonally descended from the rest of the movie. The rest of the movie is this super intelligent psychological thriller and then you throw a Medea skin in. What? Like, what is it doing here? Ah! This bitch is trying to kill me. Anna, cut this bitch. That's how I felt this chick was. Granted, she would have been funny if it were out of the context of watching this entire movie, but she just felt very out of place. But it's okay, she don't last long. Anna's running away, trying to constantly fight the urge to let the weave overtake her while simultaneously trying to outrun all of the women who have gotten weaves at the company because they've all been kind of taken over by this being, right? Which when they got to the part where the weave was crawling through the closed door, that actually legitimately creeped me out. That was nasty. I didn't like that. It made me itch. She ends up in a room, finds a gun under one of the desks and come to find out it's not a gun. It's actually a lighter. Why was it under the desk then? <laughs> but anyway, she uses that to light what she fears will be her last cigarette. But in a last final stitch effort, she realized she can light the fire alarm sprinklers with that because you're not supposed to get your hair wet. She has some very conveniently placed scissors that she's allowed to hack her hair off. And there you go, she defeated the hair monsters. Does that make sense? Not really, because Chandra in the beginning of the movie didn't die when her hair got wet. It just got messed up. That might be a plot hole. Anyway, the hair monsters are dead. Anna goes back to her apartment and she looks up what's in the pink hair lotion. And apparently one of the ingredients was pig's blood that effectively worked as an appetizer for the weave. <laughs> the final few scenes are actually quite interesting if I do say so myself. It's overlays of Anna reading the end of the Moss Hair Girl story. And this mill for hair is being run by one of the executives of the station. As long as their name was on the land, they could do as they pleased with anything that grew from me. In the end, every woman that Anna knows ends up getting a weave of some sort. In a very cyclical scene, Anna's cousin is talking about getting a weave at the same place where her hair was burned off while she was getting a relaxer. And that's the end of the movie. Now I know. Kendall, this still looks terrible. And it does. It looks bad because it's supposed to. <laughs> like, it's supposed to look bad on purpose. It's dated and bad looking because it's supposed to be. And Despite those things, it does pose some very interesting questions about black women 
and a simulation, particularly through hair, but just in general. Now, I heard some people that have a gripe about the idea that it's kind of villainizing women who wear weaves or wear wigs or what have you. And I don't think that's really what's happening here because there's, there's several scenes in which they discuss it should be a black woman's choice. She should wear her hair however she wants to, but it shouldn't be something that she's forced to do to make a living, to make a name for herself in white mandated media, especially in the late 80s, you know? The only way you saw black faces is if white people allowed you to see black faces. And that in and of itself results in the destruction of black women for the appeasement of propriety and respectability. Now, does that message get lost because everything is visually so distracting? Perhaps, and that's very valid. But you know, I... I kind of liked it, okay? It took three times watching it to like it, but I kind of like it. But with that said, by no means is a perfect film. Noted some plot holes, but there's a lot of other ones. What happened to Sandra? Is she still just touring the world with a demonic weave? What's happening? Also, why why were people still going to Virgie's when everybody that goes to Virgie's, she didn't get a name for herself? That everybody that go to Virgie's end up going cuckoo? Nobody put those two together. But despite those questions of many, I don't, feel like this movie was made carelessly. It really wasn't something that was just thrown together. <laughs> it was made with very conscious and specific choices. The scene of her family being engulfed by the hair used to represent what her mind looks like if it were completely untainted by respectability, appropriateness. It would be very Afrocentric. The hair growing longer throughout the movie to represent it's taking a mind of its own and it's at one point completely engulfing her body. It was overtaking her small frame. Not to mention some very sophisticated camera work. Like for instance, when Anna goes in for an interview with Zora, you notice that the background is supposed to be disheveled and unkempt and uncared for. And it slowly pans over to the weevilicious Zora whose background is pristine and already taken care of, even though they're both standing in the same room. But when Anna gets her hair done and they're both wearing weaves, they are essentially taking up the same amount of space. They're taking up the same quality of space and both of their backgrounds are equally as pristine. I liked it. And that is the hill I will die on! Also, the music is really good. The credits were fire. I would never skip those credits. Those are good credits. So here we are with the question, is the movie actually bad and i honestly don't know how to answer that question if i do say it's bad it's bad for a reason it's not just bad for like a hear me out it's too sophisticated dare i say to call a hear me out film yeah it's really ludicrous and really strange but i think i liked it we could argue whether or not it's effective in having those conversations due to the ludicrous imagery but is it a bad movie All I'm saying is maybe give it another chance. If you've already seen it, like maybe watch it again. You might like it if you watched it again. If you like this video, be sure to like this video. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram and Twitter, both of which are Kenny JD. If you have more bad movies that you'd like me to check out, be sure to put those down in the comment section and I will see you guys next time.